This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Allison, a professor of medicine at UCSD and VA. Um, he's a longtime friend of Stein Institute, and he has quite a background, um, including being a diver in the Navy, and also coordinating the Women's Health Initiative, the largest study on women's health in the US, and I think all over the world. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, Dr. Matthew Allison. Thank you, Maya. Um, well, the title of this presentation is Your Legs, Your Life, um, The Importance of a Healthy Lower Half. Uh, most of my research and clinical practice is on diseases that affect the legs and other um, arteries and veins in your body. But what I hope to show you today is the importance of make, maintaining good health in your legs because it really helps maintain health in the rest of your body. So as you're probably aware, um, our population in the United States is um, living longer. So if you look at this um, table, it's somewhat complicated, but I'll try to walk you through it. Um, you see that between 1935 and 1999, we've had an increase, essentially a 50% increase in longevity um, across uh, those age, age times. And that uh, pertains to life expectancy in general and then also um, active life expectancy, meaning how long people are actually staying active. And it's projected that um, in the uh, coming decades, and even in the year 2080, that the life expectancy is going to increase even more uh, over that period of time, such that individuals who were at the age of 65 in the year 2080 will be expected to live on average to the age of 88 or 89 approximately. And most of those will be active years of living. So the, the population is going to get older which is good, we, we, and that's a good thing for us, right? Um, and that applies both to the age of 65 and age of 85. Now with that, however, does come some potential issues. And this uh, slide shows this illustration of what one of the issues is, and that is that as we live longer, people are living with multiple chronic conditions, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, kidney problems, those kinds of things. And this has been increasing um, over the past decade. So if you look at this figure, you'll see that um, these bars right here, these lines I should say, show the proportion of individuals in the United States, both men and women, who have chronic conditions and how that has gone up since the year 2001 to the year 2010. And this is for two or three chronic conditions. There's also other individuals who are less fortunate and they actually have a higher rate uh, of um, chronic conditions numbering four or more, and that's what the bottom group is. But the important thing about this table, or this figure I should say, is that the numbers are increasing. And so what that relates to is a couple of things. One is which um, it causes individuals with those conditions to have worse quality of life and have problems with their activities of daily living. Going to take a shower, going to feed themselves, to cook, you know, getting dressed, all those kinds of things. And the other thing it does is it causes individuals to be institutionalized all of which cause an increase in healthcare costs. And that's what this um, table is showing. It's a little bit complicated, but if you just look, say, over in the 2004 range over here on the far right of the screen, you'll see that for individuals who are non-disabled, the average healthcare cost for that year, for one year in the year 2004 was about $1,600. But as you increase the uh, number of disabilities with respect to activities of daily living or even being institutionalized, you'll see that the numbers go up significantly such that individuals with five or six problems with activities of daily living, that's what ADL stands for, 
it's about $12,000 per year for healthcare costs on average that those patients have to pay. And that's the total population. There's somewhat similar numbers if you're between the age of 65 and 84 or over the age of 85. So there's problems with chronic conditions causing problems with activities of daily living that people who as they age have to, to deal with. The important thing is that there's potential solution to this problem. So this is a Japanese study of over 260,000 individuals and the results are shown here on, this, on the um, board. And what you see is that for the different age groups, and the age groups are, groups are along the bottom here, starting the age of 40 or so, and going up to the age of greater than 85. And these curves, what they show is mortality rate. So this is the rate of dying, essentially, for those different age groups. And there's two comparisons here. It's a very simple comparison. One is a blue line, which shows the individuals who walked less than one hour a day. And then there's a red line here, which shows the individuals who walked for more than one hour a day. And at every, pretty much every time point, uh, every age point, I should say, uh, for both men and women, those individuals who walked one hour or more per day lived longer or had a lower mortality rate. So just simply walking an hour a day seems to be protective. You can look at this another way and say, um, what's the rate of dying for those individuals who have diabetes? Diabetes is becoming a very big problem in the United States. Uh, it's associated with obesity and lack of uh, mobility to a certain extent. So if you look at this uh, table, it's a little bit complicated, but I'll walk you through it. Um, these are the individuals who don't walk at all per day, and there's what we call the reference group. We're comparing to those individuals. And then there's uh, two other groups that are listed here, one that's, that walk um, less than two hours per week, but more than zero, and then those who walk greater than two hours per week. And those individuals who walked more than two hours per week had about half, about 60% um, risk of having uh, mortality compared to those who walked no, none during the week. And that's all cause mortality, that's due to cancer or other things. And if you just look at cardiovascular disease, it's somewhat similar, it's about 59% uh, or 60% risk of having um, mortality compared to those who didn't walk at all. Another way to look at this is, what's the, the prediction for those individuals who are going to get diabetes, not die from diabetes, but to get diabetes. So we compared individuals who have low levels of physical activity, so just very minimal walking potentially, to individuals who maybe walk every day, an hour every day or more, or do more strenuous activity. And you can see for men and for women, and at different age groups, those individuals who had low physical activity had higher rates of developing diabetes compared to those individuals who did not. Which kind of makes sense. If you're able to walk and um, utilize your uh, glucose and those kinds of things, then you reduce your risk for having diabetes. Okay. So we know that if you um, can maintain mobility, you're going to reduce your risk for mortality and reduce your risk for diabetes. Um, uh, we can test you to see how well you perform and then predict if you're going to have a problem with your activities of daily living or a disability. So this figure shows this. Um, along the bottom here you'll see this term summary performance score. So this is the ability of you the patient to be able to get up out of a chair, walk a certain distance in a certain period of time, stand up and have your balance. So it tests your performance, uh, physical performance I should say. And then we also have uh, disability status here. So individuals who have a score of 12 have the least amount of problems with doing those activities. They're uh, able to do all those activities, they're not disabled in any way. And those individuals who have a score of 4 are more disabled, they have problems walking, problems standing up, and those kinds of things. And if, as you can see, the white bars indicate no disability, so this is no disability here compared to no disability in the individuals who are more disabled, <coughs> uh, have more problem with their summary performance score. And then as you go um, up in terms of their ability to do things, you have less and less um, problems with mobility in those individuals. And this is over a four year period of time. So these individuals are evaluated at one point in time and then follow to see how these things would change. And those individuals who had scores of 12, as you can see, did much better over that four year period of time in terms of being able to walk at four years later than those who did not, had a lower scores, I should say. Finally, we can also, um, improve exercise performance by simply doing in-home programs. So this is a study that came out just recently that was done in an older uh, population of individuals, both men and women, where they were given instructions essentially by the Mayo and over the phone on how to do a physical activity program, and uh, that or they were given uh, health education uh, materials. So the intervention here was giving them home education on physical activity, and um, the control group, so to speak, or the comparison group, was those who uh, were given health education. And as you can see, those individuals who were given the physical activity intervention did better in terms of their ability to walk. They walked more 
and they did more weight training activities. So that's what this line is here compared to the health education group. And this um, figure on this side shows the accelerometry. This is the number of steps they took throughout the day. And you see those in the physical activity group um, did much better than those who were in the health education group. And importantly, in terms of um, mobility, um, those individuals who were in the uh, physical education group, physical activity group, uh, had better levels of physical activity than those in the health education group. So all this points that if we can maintain mobility, we can decrease chronic conditions, we can decrease risk for diabetes and mortality and more other morbidities. So what are some of the problems that may impede you from being able to um, maintain your mobility? So uh, I'm going to talk about three specific conditions. These are common conditions at, uh, of aging. They are listed here as peripheral arterial disease, chronic venous disease, and peripheral neuropathy. We'll talk about them in order. So we'll start with peripheral arterial disease. So what peripheral arterial disease is, and you may have heard this in terms of PAD, but this is a disease of the arteries in the legs. And so what I've shown for you here on this illustration is an artery in the leg in this cartoon that comes down and it kind of splits off. So this is how the blood gets to the blood and oxygen, I should say, gets to your legs and the muscles in your legs. And in the normal case, this is a normal artery that um, has no blockage in it anywhere. The artery looks nice and clean and the blood flow is um, unimpeded, so to speak. And if you look at this artery in cross section, you'd see that there's no blockages in this artery. You compare that now with the artery on the right, which is what we call an atherosclerotic artery. This is an artery that has disease in it. This is hardening of the arteries or plaque, if you've heard those terms before. So what you see here is that the blood can come down through this area right here where the arrow is, but then it kind of runs into this area where the, the flow of blood gets narrowed and you can't get as much oxygen through there because of the blockage is impeding the blood flow. And if you look at it in terms of a cross section, this is what you'd see. Here's the plaque here in this area and this is the area where the blood can get through as compared to this where the, the blood can get through all of this area here on the left hand side. So the peripheral arterial disease is a blockage of blood flow um, that can limit the amount of oxygen supplied to the body, in this case to the legs. What this can result in in the clinical situation is when a patient walks they can have pain in their legs when they walk and this is called claudication. So in this illustration you see the gentleman stopping to stand there and he's reaching for his left calf and this is very typical of somebody who has claudication. They say I can walk you know a couple of blocks and then my leg and my calf starts to get tight and really squeeze and I get this, this, this squeezing tight uh, cramping kind of pain. I have to stand there for a couple of minutes and it goes away and I can walk you know, a certain distance again but then it comes back. Very typical for claudication and it indicates that there's a blockage there in the artery in the leg which is shown on this side of the illustration. This is the plaque that's obstructing the blood flow. So this tells us the physicians that patient has obstruction of blood flow in their legs that's impeding their ability to walk and therefore they're not as mobile as they may like to be either from a lifestyle perspective or from a work perspective. Some other consequences of peripheral arterial disease are shown here in the next couple of slides. So if the blockage is very severe, you can actually get problems with uh, flow to the toes and the, and the foot. So in this case, this toe has now uh, become gangrenous is what we call it and it's probably not viable which means we'd have to amputate it. That's what's happened in this case. So this is more of a severe case. The patient's probably gone through where he had cramps in his leg when he was walking to the point now where he actually can't sustain the tissue uh, in his toes and his uh, uh, distal foot. So how do we diagnose peripheral arterial disease? So this is um, a very simple test to do and we do it in the vascular laboratory. It's non-invasive. There's no needles or anything like that. And we simply have the patient lie down on the table. And I'm actually going to show this to you and hopefully this will, you'll be able to hear the sounds. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is measuring the blood pressure in different parts of the body. Okay, so we'll, let's watch the, um, the demonstration here for a second if I can get it to come up. So what, we, what you were hearing there was the pulse of blood flowing through, in this case, the wrist of our, uh, our patient here. Okay, and so what we can do with that is we can actually use that to measure blood pressure in the arm. It's just like what you're doing when you go to the doctor's office and you put the cuff up here. In this case, we're just checking it at the wrist. We then do the same thing, but we do it at the ankles. You can see the blood pressure cuff is down here. We also have them on the arms, but in this case, they're on the ankles as well. And so we do the same thing. Now, when you listen this time, you'll hear that same whooshing kind of sound, but then you'll hear it go away, and then it'll come back. So just listen to this for a second. <laughs> Wow. 
So what we've done there is we were able to find the, the pulse, in this case at the ankle, and one of the arteries at the ankle. And then we blew up the blood pressure cuff and to the point where the artery become blocked. We kind of squeezed it until it was closed. And that was the point where you didn't hear the sound anymore. And then we released the pressure in the um, blood pressure cuff until we were able to allow blood to uh, flow through the artery again. And um, that's when you heard the sound again. And I actually can show that to you, but I have to use a different, let's see here, I think it's right here. It's this one. So let me play this for you. And this is what, we, what the technologists see when they do your uh, blood pressure measurements for this test. So this is what we just heard. So it's gone. Blood pressure's over here. It's coming down. So we can use that to um, help us determine whether somebody has what's called peripheral arterial disease. And so this um, illustration shows you how we do that. We take the blood pressure in the ankle and we divide it by the blood pressure in the arm. Now just based upon how we are built, the blood pressure in the legs should always be the same as or greater than the blood pressure in your arms. And typically it's a little bit higher. So if for some reason, if you have a blockage, for instance, in your leg and you have less blood flow to your ankle, in this case the ankle arteries, the pressure in those ankle arteries is going to go down. And that means that the ratio of the blood pressure in the leg, or in the ankle in this case, to that in the arm is going to be less than one. And that tells us that there is a significant blockage of blood flow in your legs. And that's how we, one way we can diagnose peripheral arterial disease. And it's very simple, it takes about 20 minutes, and as you can see, it's non-invasive. And we can, we can kind of uh, get a feel for how extensive the disease is using this um, classification here. Anyone above the uh, number of 0 0.90, it's, it's a little bit different than 1.0, but that's okay. It's considered normal. And then we have mild obstructive disease, those from 0.7 to 0.9. 0.4 to 0.7 is moderate obstruction, and then those who have a score or a value of less than 0.4 are considered severe. So we use this information to diagnose individuals with peripheral arterial disease and then be able to determine how we can treat them, and which is what we're going to talk about next. So you may be asking, you know, well, what can I do if I have peripheral arterial disease? Well, if you came to saw me in the clinic, the first thing we talk about would be how bad your disease is. And if it's in the mild to moderate category, one of the first things we potentially ask you to do is to walk. And people always look at me kind of cross-eyed and say, but it hurts when I walk. I have a pain in my legs when I walk. And I understand that. It's exactly true. But what we ask you to do is walk about 40 to 45 minutes a day continuously. Now, it can't be continuously because people see at 10 minutes, my legs start to hurt and I have to stop. I say, that's fine. You stop and rest for about two to three minutes. Then you start walking again. Then you stop and you walk again. So the total amount of walking time is about 45 minutes. And if you do that for a year, you would be able to double your walking distance. So let's say you came and see me today and you had peripheral arterial disease, you had the pain in your legs, and you're able to walk, say, a football field length, 100 yards. You did this walking program where you walked five days a week at least, 45, 45 minutes a day, and you came back a year later, you'd be able to walk two football fields. And for some individuals, that's all they need. They say, I need to be able to walk another 50 yards so I can make it to the bus stop. Um, I want to go see my friend's house, and it's two blocks down, and I can walk one block. So in some cases, that's sufficient. So a walking program is one of the first things we do. If that doesn't work, <clears throat> the next thing we can do is try medications. And we use a specific medication that's shown up here on the uh, on this screen. It's called Platol. And we use this medication because you know, studies like this have shown that it is superior to placebo and some other medications for improving your walking distance. So if you look at this illustration, you'll see that what, what's happened in this trial is that there was three medications, in quotes, um, tested. Platol, Trentol, and placebo. Placebo is like a sugar pill, which you're all probably familiar with, which is not supposed to do anything to improve your walking distance. They had people walk at baseline, and then they gave them the medication and say, okay, we're going to test you once a month to see how, how far you can walk. And they said, when you're at home, go ahead and walk as well, but we want to test you when you come here. And so they did that you know, every month. You can see four, eight, 12, month, uh, 12 weeks, et cetera. And over time, essentially starting from the beginning, the group that took the Platol medication did better. They were able to walk farther. The line is higher up. This is walking distance. And they did so significantly better than the Trentol and the Platol medications. So this is evidence to us that this medication can improve your walking distance. The important thing is that this medication will not cure your disease, your underlying disease, uh, meaning that it won't get rid of those plaques. It won't get rid of the blockage. 
But if, you're, if your goal is to improve your walking distance, it can help with that to a certain extent, about 60 to 65 percent improvement in walking distance. So if you do that with your walking program, you can see you can actually increase your walking distance quite a bit. And again, this may be all, it needs, all you need to get to that point of walking about an hour every day so that you can improve your chances for living longer and healthier, et cetera. Okay. If that doesn't work, there are some other things that can be done. These are uh, operative procedures. Um, uh, balloon angioplasty, you may have heard this term angioplasty before in terms of coronary artery disease and um, being able to open up coronary arteries, people who have angina or having a heart attack, those kind of things. It's the same situation, but it's just in the legs in this case. So what we do is we take um, a balloon, in this case, that we put on a little wire, and we get it to the point where there's a plaque, and you can see the plaque right here in yellow, and there's a little space we try to get it through right here. And then once it's through there, we blow up the balloon, and then once that's done, the opening is now bigger for the blood to get through. Okay? So this is one potential way of increasing blood flow to your legs. What we do more, uh, more recently now, though, is not just the balloon angioplasty, but we also leave stents behind because we found that just the angioplasty didn't last as long as we wanted it to in terms of keeping the, 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 the opening uh, wide. So in this case, what we do is we put this metal device called a stent on the top of the balloon, and then we open it up and leave the stent behind, and it kind of acts as a strut, so to speak, or a scaffolding to keep the artery open. And in, in this way, you can see on, over here, um, the artery stays open with that area of plaque and it doesn't close back down. And the patient usually has a pretty good result. <clears throat> and here's an illustration of what some typical results are. Maybe a little small for you to see, but I'll try to point it out for you. This arrow right here shows area of blockage on an angiogram. So this is an artery and leg coming down, and this dark spot here is where there's not as much blood flow going through here because there's blockage right there. This is the same illustration, just kind of in a different projection. And here is after doing the angioplasty, you can see that there's no defect like there is over here. It's nice and, and dark gray, so to speak, right through this area of the leg. So we've opened up the artery, the blood is flowing nicely through that area, and the patient may have relief of symptoms and be able to walk much farther now. So that's peripheral arterial disease, um, how we diagnose it, and some specific ways of treating it. There may be other ways that it can be treated, but those are the standard of care treatments that we use. The next condition I want to talk about is lower extremity chronic venous disease. This is not known as, as well in terms of causing problems with walking, but I'll show some illustrations of reasons why it can be. <clears throat> so unlike your um, arteries, which carry blood from your heart down to the rest of your body, your veins carry blood from your, say, hands, feet, legs, back to your, your heart. And so what that means is it has to, the blood flow has to go up instead of down, if you can, can understand what I mean. So on this side of the illustration, you see flow in a normal vein where the blood is flowing this way. You know, the foot is down here, let's say, and goes through this valve and goes up and eventually gets back up to the heart up here. And then as the, the um, heart, I mean, uh, as the blood is not pumped, the valve will close and it prevents backflow of uh, blood in this vein. So you have little valves that's shown here, 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 okay? And when the blood is not being pumped up to your heart, the valves close and prevent backflow. When those valves don't work too, so well anymore, you do get the flood, uh, flow of blood going up, but you also get backflow of uh, blood going back down to where it came from. And what that does is it causes a volume increase, meaning that there's more blood in that area of the vein where usually it's you know, used to a smaller amount. And that causes the vein to dilate and causes some other changes to the vein wall itself. What that results in is what we call varicose veins. You're probably all familiar with that term. And I have an illustration here to show you that. So these are varicose veins here and here on the calf of this patient. Some other problems is that it can cause swelling. If the vein gets leaky, so to speak, it can cause accumulation of fluid. In this case, you can see that the right leg is significantly larger or wider, if you want to use that term, than the left leg. And the foot is also swollen here. This disease, if left untreated um, for a long enough period of time, can cause changes to the skin. And that's what you see here. You see a brown discoloration. Uh, in this area, and this is where actually blood is kind of leaked out from the veins, so to speak. Uh, and it's kind of been deposited there, and this is what it looks like after it's been deposited and kind of degraded. It's just the iron that's kind of in your skin now from the blood cells that have leaked out. And finally, uh, one of the complications we don't like to see, this is an ulcer in this patient's uh, lower leg. Um, these are not typically overly painful, but they are just uh, uncomfortable, uh, and they can become infected. Uh, and so for those reasons, and you know, also the swelling that typically goes along with this, patients don't like to walk very much when they have these conditions. So again, this is one of those impediments to uh, being mobile, being able to walk. So how do we diagnose them? So um, the first thing we can do 
is use an ultrasound device. And an ultrasound device uses sound waves to make an image. So we can place the ultrasound probe on a leg, in this case, and shoot the sound waves into the leg and be able to image um, the arteries or the veins. In this case, it's going to be the veins. So let me show you here what we're going to do. So in this illustration, we're going to have the technicians actually going to show you how we compress the vein to make sure it's compressible. Compressible means that it, it collapses all the way, and that's a sign that the, the vein is healthy and there's no blood clots in there. So that's what this first one is going to show you. So we did that on the front of the leg. Now, I don't know if this one's working. It is working, OK. And we also do it on the back of the leg here. So it's an entirely non-invasive test, as you can see. And the technician was essentially just pushing in gently on the leg to try to see that um, vein compress. And that's the next slide I'm going to show you here. So look right here. You'll see this vein. It closes. Okay, it's over here. Closes. It's there, and it closes. Okay. Let me show you that one more time. Okay. Right here. Closes this round, dark structure here. Closes, and it closes. Okay. So that tells us that the vein is not blocked off by anything, and that blood should be able to flow in the right direction. Um, um, in this uh, segment. The other thing we do is we actually take the leg and we kind of squeeze it a little bit and then we can watch the blood flow going through uh, the area of the vein that we're interested in. And so in the, most, in the most normal cases, the blood will go up and then it won't come back down. And that's what you see here on the left, although this is kind of upside down, so to speak. This is the blood flowing up the leg even though the, this um, waveform, what we call waveform, is going down. It's being augmented by the squeeze, so the blood's going up, but the graph is showing it going down. This is the way we do things. But in the abnormal case, we do that same squeeze. The blood goes up, as it's shown right here. But then you can see this, where it's, this part of the graph is showing blood flowing back down. So this is two very simple tests. Again, non-invasive, no needles or anything like that, using an ultrasound probe where we can help, where we can diagnose problems with the veins that may lead to venous insufficiency. How do we treat venous insufficiency? Well, there's a couple, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, one way that's becoming more and more popular nowadays is called radiofrequency ablation. There's also laser uh, ablation. They kind of work under the same principle, whereby we insert a catheter, which is pretty, pretty thin, and then we get into the place in the vein that we want to. So you can see on this side of the illustration, this is the catheter right here, and it's in a vein. The blue is the vein, okay? And this you can see here is where we entered the skin, through the skin. And then what we do is we heat up the end of the um, catheter device to about 120 degrees by one of two ways, essentially, either by a laser or by the, the device um, vibrating extremely fast. And what that does is essentially burns the vein closed. So this is the case where the vein is not working properly anymore. We want to close that vein down because you have a lot of other veins that take up the slack, so to speak, to be able to work. So we do this on specific veins that you don't really necessarily need, per se, because there's a lot of duplication of these veins in your legs. And this way, it gets rid of a lot of the symptoms and it can even get rid of the swelling that you may have and heal venous ulcers like I showed you before. So this is one technique for closing down bad veins. Another is called sclerotherapy. This has been around for centuries. Um, this essentially is where we take a specific type of liquid that we add air to to make foam. And then we inject the foam through this small needle that you see right here into a vein that is you know, varicose. It's squiggly like this, it's dilated. And when the foam gets in there, it causes the blood to clot in there, and it also causes destruction of the vein wall. And what that ha does is it causes the, uh, essentially an occlusion or a blockage of that vein, so it won't work anymore, and over time it'll just scar down. And in that case, you know, hopefully that will relieve some of the symptoms that the patient's having again with the swelling or, or whatever they're having problems with. So another method that we can use, again, we use these somewhat interchangeably depending on the clinical situation that the patient presents with. 
And here's an example of some typical results that you can get. You can see in this patient, they had large varicose veins all through here, and then after the procedures were done, you see that the leg looks pretty good at this case. Right. So the final condition I want to talk to you about is called peripheral neuropathy. This occurs in people with diabetes. Um, and what happens is that when you're diabetic, you get disease of the small arteries and not just the big arteries in your body. So in a normal situation, you have um, blood um, flow to those uh, nerves in your feet or elsewhere in your body that supplies oxygen to those nerves so they can survive. In some cases, in people who have diabetes, there's problems with those little arteries. And what happens is that you don't get good blood flow to the nerves. And that's what you're seeing here in the middle part of this illustration right through here. And that the blood supply is not good. The nerve is dying. And then down over here, the nerve is getting even worse. And it's you know, essentially non-functional or is dis dysfunctional. What that can result in is different kinds of symptoms. Um, some people complain of pins and needles. Their feet feel like they're on fire. They have numbness on the bottom of their feet. It's very uncomfortable for them. They have problems with balance, and they can't walk. Again, we're back to problems with mobility. This is a problem where they have this, and they say, I just don't want to walk because you know, I'm unstable. My feet hurt. You know, when I walk, it makes it worse. So um, one of the complications, in addition to those pins and needles sensations, is that since people are numb on the bottom of their feet, they can get what we call pressure sores in different parts of their feet. So here's a, in between their uh, toes. This is on the bottom of their big toe. And this is on kind of the base of their big toe. And these are painful to a certain extent. And they can become infected, although you know, frequently they don't. Again, another reason why patients uh, who have peripheral neuropathy and have these ulcers, they don't want to walk. How do we diagnose it? We diagnose it using a bunch of different clinical tests. Um, this is one of them, where we take a tuning fork and we place it on the foot in a specific location. And the patient's able to tell us whether um, they feel a vibration or not. Okay? Very simple test. And it's taught to you know, all medical students across the country. If they can't feel the vibration, that may be an indication that they have neuropathy in their foot. Another thing we do is we take the toe and we simply move it either up or down. Um, our bodies and our brain work together to be able to tell us you know, that my hand is up or my hand is down. Well, we do the same thing here. We ask the patient to close their eyes and tell them to have them tell us which way their toe moves, either up or down. If they're not able to discern that, that may be an indication that they're not feeling their toe well enough to uh, understand where it is in space, and they may have peripheral neuropathy. We can also take a very fine uh, metal wire, so to speak, and uh, touch it to the bottom of the foot in specific uh, locations. And patients with peripheral neuropathy of the feet, especially this numbness on the bottom of their feet, won't be able to feel this. Another sign of peripheral neuropathy. And finally, there is some um, fancy testing if you wanted to do that. We can actually look at the velocity of what we call nerve conduction. So impulses going from one part of a nerve to another, in this case in the leg. You can monitor that. And if there's abnormalities in that, that may be a sign that you have peripheral neuropathy. We treat peripheral neuropathy with, typically with medications. Um, this is a condition that, you, like um, the plaque in the arteries in perif uh, peripheral arterial disease, we technically can't get rid of the neuropathy, per se, but we can help control the symptoms to a certain extent. And we do that with a large range of medications. And you can see that some of them don't seem to really apply to nerve problems. An anti-seizure medication would be seen to be somewhat you know, bizarre to use on somebody with neuropathy. But there are certain ones that actually haven't tried and do work on patients with peripheral neuropathy. So there's different types of medications. There are um, uh, transcutaneous devices, stimulation devices. Uh, this is called a TENS unit. If you've ever been to physical therapy, they can take a medication and put it underneath this TENS unit and kind of push it into your skin. And it uh, tends to relieve the symptoms to a certain extent. Most important thing with people who have diabetes is to control your diabetes. Make sure your blood sugar is within the range that your primary care provider or your other health care provider says they should be in. And um, take your medications regularly, because this will prevent the progression of peripheral neuropathy or even the initiation of it. And as I showed before, you can have problems with your feet in terms of getting ulcers and non-healing wounds on your feet. So you need to make sure you take care of your feet very well because you don't want to get those ulcers because they, they can lead to serious problems. And this is just a survey. There's other medications that are, are, are being developed. There's other um, non-traditional, if you want to use that term, um, therapies such as acupuncture, et cetera, that some people use and have been successful with. It's just that the literature is still, I mean, the studies are still coming, forthcoming in terms of proving that those actually work or they don't. So I want to just close out now to, uh, to summarize what we talked about, that um, older adults in the United States are living longer, but they're doing so with chronic conditions that may affect their mobility. And when you affect somebody's mobility, in particular, you decrease their mobility, um, you have higher levels of problems 
such as getting diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and even cause uh, uh, increases risk for death. So for these reasons, if you maintain mobility, um, you can decrease the rates of those problems and decrease problems with your patients, improve their quality of life, um, and decrease healthcare costs. And the overall goal is to keep us doing you know, the things that we like to do, seeing wonderful sights <laughs> and, and enjoying, enjoying nature. So I thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, please. Yes, there are certain types of, okay, I have to repeat the question. They told me before we started. Um, so uh, can you talk about neuropathy after chemotherapy? So there are certain chemotherapeutic agents that are associated with neuropathy. And the, the problem with, if I can answer your, or am I interpreting your question correctly, do you ask if it's reversible or not? That's one part. Of one part of your question. And from my knowledge, the answer to that question is no. Nerves don't tend to regenerate very well, especially as we get older. So in most cases, from what I've seen and in the literature I've read, that nerves don't regenerate and you don't get rid of the neuropathy per se. And is there a second part to that question? Is the mechanism the same as in diabetic neuropathy? Um, I don't know the answer specifically to that question because there's a lot of chemotherapeutic agents. Um, but my understanding is that it's not necessarily causing problems with the vascular supply to the nerve, but rather it actually damages the nerve itself. And that's probably one of the more reasons why you don't uh, recover from neuropathy from chemotherapeutic agent. Please. If there is no recovery for that, um, <coughs> what can be expected, I guess? I mean, the, the, your lecture is perfectly timed to the day. I had chemotherapy last year that have peripheral neuropathy now. At first I thought it was going away, but now I've noticed that it's affecting my walk, my walk, my walking. Yeah. Considerably. Yeah. Uh, to the point where I really walk funny. Yeah, so I, I think I was hoping that there'd be some something that could be done for that. Yeah, there are certain medications that can decrease the symptoms you may have of the burning and the tingling sensations you have in your feet and hopefully potentially improve to a certain extent um, your ability to feel your feet, although that hasn't really been proven. Uh, and if those medications help, that would be one potential mechanism. Uh, again, some people have had some luck with acupuncture and some other types of those kind of non-traditional therapies that you can consider. But in general, uh, my understanding, it seems to be kind of borne out by a lot of uh, discussion with patients, is that they never, their neuropathy kind of never goes away. They kinda, it kind of maybe burned, I mean, it kind of dies out a little bit, but it's always kind of there at kind of a certain level, and they kind of just learn to live with it. And unfortunately, medical science hasn't figured that, that problem yet. Learning to live with it mean that you can there's some exercises or something that you can do. I, I think you learn your, to help your walking, your gait. Your yeah, I think you. Or yeah, the question was uh, learning to live with it. What does that mean? I think it means that you uh, learn to cope, kind of subconsciously, and how to uh, be mobile, and you, you learn to uh, deal with the difference that you now are confronted with. So you may walk slower. You may walk with your feet wider. Uh, you may walk with a cane. The, all those kinds of things may be ways of coping with the the disability that you kind of have at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Disappointing. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm not sure. You had your hand up next, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, so the question was, are there medications that help after spinal stenosis and some of the symptoms go away? Uh, spinal stenosis is, is an, kind of an exception to what I was mentioning because you can actually get most of your nerve function back after you have the surgery for spinal stenosis. Typically, you can't. Does and that, that take some time? It does take time. So you know, this may take six months to a year, et cetera. So okay. yeah. I'm not sure who had the hands up next, and I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, I can't see very well. Please. So the question was, how does a medical therapy for uh, neuropathy differ from the chiropractic treatment of neuropathy? So um, the, my understanding, I'm not a chiropractor. I know some chiropractors. Um, uh, the technique of chiropractic is a manipulation of bones and muscles to uh, obtain optimal anatomic alignment, I think that's the terms that they use. And so uh, they try to uh, move muscles and tissue so that there's no longer pressure on specific nerves. I think that's the chiropractic principle. The medical principle, if you want to do that, or if you want to use the term allopathic medical principle, is to try to find medical therapies such as medications or, or other modalities um, that, in this case, would be chiropractic, to improve nerve function. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay, sure. 
Are you familiar with something called Charcot's arthrop arthropathy? <laughs> yeah, yes, I am a little bit. It's a very destructive process. And I was told as a result, uh, it can be a, uh, like a, it, can, it leads from neuropathy sometimes. Yeah, because you, you, don't, you don't feel, you become kind of numb at that spot, and then you kind of can wear down, so to speak, and the joint kind of becomes destroyed because of uh, bad, bi what we call biomechanics. You're not using your foot quite right because you don't feel that you're damaging it. Is that okay? Okay. Please, uh, I'm, I think I have to go over here next, but please. Uh, the question is, is, can vitamin E relieve cramps and spasms in the legs and the feet? And I'm assuming you're meaning like at night, especially when you're, yeah. when you're sleeping. Yeah, I haven't seen any evidence that vitamin E can do that. Any, any, yeah, good evidence that it's going to do that. people who were successful? Uh, well, I, I have patients tell me a lot of things about what, what solves their, their, their problems. For instance, I have one patient told me that he started taking a teaspoon of mustard and that got rid of his cramps. <laughs> it worked for him, so I said, okay, okay. <laughs> but I haven't seen any, any you know, scientific evidence that it works. Okay, I think, somebody had the hand up, please. <laughs> for taking it. Okay, the question is, can you take a home blood pressure monitor and put it on your legs? And I think the, in, uh, the implication is there to use it for the ankle brachial index. Right. Yes. You can do that. It'll give you a rough estimate, but it's not going to be as accurate as, as if you use different devices, kind of like what we used. Because the home blood pressure monitor works on a little bit different of a principle than the one we use. But in general, it can give you an idea if that's what you wanted to do. Do you have, did you have a second question, or is that it? No, that was it. Say, where, where on your ankle? Oh, where on your ankle. Uh, you need to be, if you take your thumb and you go, you put that on the top of the bone in the middle, on the, right here, this, this part right here, and you go above that, you put the bottom of the cuff, the blood pressure cuff, right there. Does that make sense? Okay. There's a lady in a pink shirt, I think, had her hand up. Is that right? No, there's a man right there. Okay, sorry, go ahead. The light is right there, and I literally can't see anything right there. <laughs> How can you tell the difference between a Charlie horse and PAD? A Charlie horse? Can you define a Charlie horse for me? Oh, you're, you're somewhere and all of a sudden uh, you your get a cramp. muscle becomes very, very painful and uh -huh. stiff and so you kind of try to stretch it until that severe pain goes away. Yeah, so it's somewhat similar in terms of its pain, but it's different in terms of um, how it kind of evolves over time. So the Charlie horse is a cramp, right? And it comes on usually, boom, all of a sudden like that. The, the pain of claudication, which I described for you early, takes a little bit of time to develop. You start feeling it maybe at a half a block, and then at like a block you're saying it's getting bad, and then at two blocks it's really bad, and you have to stop. You can take a charlie horse and you can rub it out, whereas if you have claudication and you rub your calf, it won't necessarily help. Let's see. When we sit, would you recommend that we not, not cross our legs? Is it bad to cross your legs? When you sit? Oh, okay. So this is the question about varicose veins, right? Yeah, the question is, should, when we sit, should we not um, cross our legs? Well, as, as a preventist, I should tell you that you shouldn't sit very long anyways. Actually, we should all stand up and sit back down. <laughs> but um, uh, we have to think about what you're doing potentially anyways when you cross your legs. The crossing your legs for a few minutes is, is not going to cause any problems. Um, and if you, the only way it can really cause a problem is if you squeeze tightly, you know, if your leg is really tightly wrapped around the other leg. Because then you really can compress. Otherwise, if it's just laying on top of the other one, it's really not going to cause much of a problem in terms of blockage of blood flow in the veins. OK? Um, I think I see a hand there. Yes. Achiness in the arms and the legs at night. This is sleep. Yeah, well, that's a pretty uh, nondescript um, symptom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would probably have to ask you some several other questions to try to get to the bottom of that. Um, uh, I can tell you, though, that achiness in the legs at the end of the day is one of the signs of uh, chronic venous disease. Because you're on your feet all day, and the blood's kind of pooling in your leg, even though you may not know it. So your legs feel heavy, and you get home, and they feel tired and fatigued. Now, the arms are a different story, because you really don't usually have vein problems in your arms. So I, I'd have to, we have to find out more about that. Uh, please, up there, probably about six rows up. I'm not sure. OK, please. Yeah. I have an neuropathy in my feet. I've had it about two years. Uh -huh. But I, I've been tested for diabetes, and I don't have diabetes. So how did I get it? Uh, there, there are a lot of um, potential medications that can cause neuropathy. There are other types of um, inflammatory conditions that can cause neuropathy. I'm not sure if you've been tested for those. So diabetes is just one of potentially many causes of neuropathy. But diabetes in our society is the most common because diabetes is very prevalent in our society. Uh, sure, right there. You, uh, you 
you're saying we you know do this and we do that in your labs and all that um, do you take the public in are you I mean uh, uh, so uh, I'm I trying to find somebody that yeah and, uh, I see um, well this I probably shouldn't do any corporate sponsorship but come talk to me after um, <laughs> But I, I work in the VA hospital, so I can see veterans. Um, but um, if, you wanted, if you want a referral for somebody that works in town for veins, I can tell you, but I have to tell you after. I can't tell you in a public forum like this. Uh, way up top there. Yeah, sure. So the question is about leg exercises, which ones I would recommend. Um, I guess it would depend upon what kind of leg exercises and what your goal is. So could you answer the question of what your goal is? General leg health. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's two types of exercise in, in, in general. There is kind of weight training exercise, so resistance exercise, and then there is um, aerobic training where that's walking, jogging, cycling, all those kind of things. To me, I don't care if you do which one you do, they're all good for you in certain ways. Now, I will tell you that um, exercise such as swimming is good as we get older because it's easier on our joints. And if you do a backstroke, you get good, good um, exercise of the, leg, uh, the muscles in your legs. If you do a lot of jogging, that tends to be harder on your knees. So you really have to figure out what's best for your situation and what your body can tolerate in terms of the joints in your legs and your ankles. But in general, whatever you do, just do it. I mean, I, it's, it's a Nike, I guess it's a Nike slang, but you know, we just want people to be more active. If you want to walk, that's good. You want to jog, that's good. I'm not going to tell you necessarily which one is better. If you want to get muscle strength, obviously you're going to have to do resistance training. And that's where you're going against some kind of a weight. You know, you're doing some weight training on a machine or something like that, if that's what your goal is. But if your goal is gen you know, general leg health, just exercising your health and your legs in a lot of different ways is beneficial. Please. Is it common for neuropathy to start in one foot and then go on to the next, or do you get both, or how, is it, how does it happen? Uh, we see it both, but about half the time we see it in both legs, in both feet, and the other half we see it in one leg, and then it goes to the other. Please. See, the question is, what would you recommend medically for neuropathy or cramps in the legs? So it, it, the answer to your question is we have to determine what the cause of your neuropathy or cramps is. So in some cases, vein disease, like I showed here, causes cramps in the legs. We fix your vein disease, and your cramps can go away. In some cases, there's other problems. There's electrolyte problems and some other blood chemistry kind of problems that need to be corrected. But in some cases, we don't know what causes it in terms of the cramps. Maybe if somebody's dehydrated, they need to be hydrated a little bit more. What, what, what do I do when I have a, these cramp attacks in my feet and I almost go crazy? Yeah, what a lot of patients tell me they do is they get up and walk around and it gets rid of their cramp. In terms of preventing the cramp, you know, this is something that's hard for us to, we don't have any good treatments for it, yes. They, we used to treat it with something called quinine, but now the FDA banned it, so we can't use it anymore. Um, but, you know, other, th other than that, we don't have any real good treatments for cramps and legs, other than treating the underlying condition, which may be vein disease in some cases. Uh, let's see, I I'll get back to yours in a second, but I, please, up here on the upper left. Yeah, so the question is, is can more walking help a patient with PAD get better? Is, does that sound right? Improve the, um, narrow, uh, the narrowed artery. Yeah, so um, what the walking will do in a patient who has PAD, what it will do will improve your walking distance. And then it will also potentially help your risk factors for the blockage in your artery getting worse. Um, it typically, though, will not make the blockage in your artery better. We have a hard time making the blockages better but it can maybe help stabilize it by keeping your weight down, uh, preventing you from getting diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, please. Is physical therapy in the water just as good as walking on land for osteoporosis? So um, if, you, if you are in water in a pool, let's say, and you're using it for osteoporosis, it's better because it's a resistance training exercise. So you're using more muscle, um, you have to strain your muscles more, so to speak, and that puts more tension on the bone, uh, and that's what causes the bone to grow. So anything that puts tension on, a mu on the bone, that's what causes the bone to grow. Someone had a question right here, please. Yes, I was diagnosed with uh, superficial vein thrombosis three uh -huh. years ago, uh -huh. and so I guess the standard procedure is to wear the compression stockings for life. Okay. And so, um, at night, um, <coughs> like about six o'clock, my legs will start feeling spasmy, you know, that I have to take the compression stockings off. Uh -huh. 
so I have to go to bed and you know. Yeah. And then uh, if they're still feeling bad like that, I've, I've seen on, uh, on the internet where you can do these exer this exercise where you raise your leg and mm -hmm. you do the alphabet. Okay. And that seems to really help. For your, for your cramping in your legs? For the, for the pain, you know, the, the really heaviness. Where uh -huh. they, yeah. yeah. So in general, for people who have vein problems and have the swelling in their legs and the heaviness in their legs, you don't necessarily have to wear stockings um, at night. But if you get home and you can put your feet up, you can take your stockings off. And we tell the patients that they don't need to wear their stockings to bed. No, I don't wear Good. them to bed, but, Good. but still, I, I, you, know, you just got to take them off. At yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just make sure that you keep your legs elevated to a certain extent, and that helps the fluid kind of drain out of your legs naturally. Uh, the question is, is what's the cause and treatment for restless legs? Um, I'm not sure we understand the cause of restless legs. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, so I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Uh, I have heard that there are some medications. Um, they're actually antidepressant medications that they're using to treat restless legs. I'm not sure what the success rate is. I think it's kind of a, a marginal uh, or mild success rate. Right behind, did you have a question right behind? So the question is whether you would keep the prescription hose on overnight or not. The only time we recommend patients keep their prescription hose on overnight is when we've done a procedure on their legs for their veins and we want to make sure the vein stays closed. Otherwise, we tell patients to wear them you know, on a regular basis and not after having a procedure that they can take them off at night when they go to bed. Okay? Uh, way up top there is, is uh, varicose veins hereditary. Um, they, there, there are several risk factors for varicose veins and uh, a family member such as your mother, father, brother, sister having varicose veins is a risk factor. So there is a hereditary component to it. To it. People who are overweight get varicose veins. People who have diabetes get varicose veins. People who smoke get varicose veins. Those are the other risk factors for varicose veins. And does that predispose you to some of these other ailments? Uh, can you be more specific besides? Oh, I see. Um, in terms of uh, vein disease uh, causing you to have a higher likelihood of having uh, peripheral arterial disease, uh, there is no association that we know of. And the same goes for um, uh, peripheral neuropathy unless you have diabetes. And then, therefore, diabetes is a kind of the common link between the two. The diabetes is causing the varicose veins and the diabetes is causing the peripheral neuropathy. Oh, please. Is there a balance you do? I know that you are supposed to stand more than you sit. But then you also said some people get really tired if they're on their feet all day. So what's the balance of standing? Yeah. So uh, we're, we're actually proposing a research study to look at this precise question. But um, I think the important part is, is to stand periodically for maybe a couple of minutes. It's a process of standing and you know, kind of using your muscles and just not, not being entirely sedentary for very long periods of time. So maybe you know, once an hour to stand up for a couple of minutes, maybe walk around a little, and then you can go ahead and sit back down. But we don't have the exact answer to how often specifically everyone should do it. Please. What classification of doctor does veins and things, you know, not an internist or uh -huh. a, what, 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 what do you call it? So um, the specialty is called phlebology. The doctor is certified or a diplomat of the American uh, College of Phlebology. Um, vascular surgeons also do um, those types of procedures where they treat veins. Uh, the types of doctors that do it range from vascular surgeons to general practitioners. So pretty much anybody can do vein problems. Oh, sorry, go ahead. How do, maybe you have addressed this and I probably didn't hear when the get cramps and then the toes freeze. Uh -huh. They're paralyzed and you can't, can't move anything. So what the, your question is, what do you do when you have those cramps? What do you do or how can you find out why they, they happen? Or what is the cause of it? So to answer your second part of your question, I think you need to talk to your doctor about um, your condition. The, the first part of your question is what do you do? And I think the best thing to do when you're actually having the cramp is to massage them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it's once they're cramped, you know, and really tight. You know, there's not much you can do about it. Yeah, unfortunately. Please. When you <coughs> talked about this study is for an hour for exercise, does it have to be an hour all at once, or can it be two thirty minutes? Um, in terms of the walking that we were talking about, 
It can be two 30 separate minutes. Uh, oh, it's a, uh, let me ask a different question. Is that for peripheral arterial disease or just in general walking? Just in general. Yeah, it can be two 30 minute periods as long as it's in the same day. It, it depends. Uh, the question is, the, the, the terrain matter? Um, it depends on how quickly you want to get in shape. Um, uh, if, you want to, if you walk up a hill, you're exerting yourself much more and your muscles much more and you will become more cardiovascularly fit by walking up a hill compared to walking on a flat. But a lot of patients with PAD, peripheral arterial disease and claudication, can't walk uphill. It's just too hard for them, so they walk on a flat. But if you, if you watch athletes, they're actually running up and down the hills quite a bit because it's very strenuous work and they get in much better shape much more quickly that way. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>